Mona, I asked you to send me your biography, and I'm I'm not sure if I regret asking you or not. <laughs> I've got a, a mere seven lines here just to work through quickly. They're bullet points, so I hope I hope not to bore you with your own bio. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. Mornay Mostert is involved with, and forgive me if I've edited this dreadfully, you're part of South Africa's National Planning Commission. You're chairman of the academic board of a Dutch technology company called Smart Bio. You're a member of the international think tank, The Club of Rome. You're also an author. One of your books, at least that you've published, is Systemic Leadership, Leadership Development in the Era of Complexity. We're halfway. Hang in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you're also the former director of the Institute for Futures Research at Stellenbosch University, a fine institute. Uh, you have a PhD uh, in technology and innovation, and you're the inventor of a fascinating tool, the Mindset Index. It's a world first in the scientific assessment of strategic mindsets. So mm. out of one to 10, one being awful, 10 being acceptable, where, how, how is that as a snapshot of your bio? <laughs> this... Absolutely spot on. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Morning, Mostard. Uh, why are you involved with leadership? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, everything else was taken, Dominic. Um, I've been curious about the subject just for the longest time. I suppose it started a bit in, in the family. My father was always on these kind of leadership development programs and had me these notes. And of course, I wouldn't understand a, a word of it. And I landed sort of by accident as a first job doing management training in a college set up really for previously disadvantaged students of management. And that job I accepted uh, with complete ignorance of what any of this was all about. But I realized very quickly that, of course, it's ludicrous for me to try and help people to learn about management when, when I myself have very little knowledge of it and also really haven't practiced any of it. Of course, that didn't deter me in the least, but it did make me deeply curious about how this actually works on the one hand and on the other, obsessed almost with how to help others to learn more about management and leadership. And then I, I was, in a sense, really just lucky, learned more and more about the subject and always in parallel, Dominic, the, the methodology. So always, what is this stuff? And then how do you learn about it? And, and, and uh, today I, I continue that curiosity and then was privileged to do a, a lot of this work uh, in London for various organizations, came back to South Africa, was head of the School of Leadership of Discovery, um, and then uh, went into consulting uh, all, all over the world, about 12 African countries, a lot of it in the Middle East. Uh, and when it went really well, it was London, Paris, Geneva and Rome. And so really uh, had this great privilege to, to be with groups of increasingly senior people in increasingly large organizations in various parts of the world. And they eventually wrote a, a, a PhD, uh, not only on uh, what it is, but very importantly, how could one learn more deeply what leadership could mean and how it contributes uh, to um, not only shareholders, investors, other stakeholders, but indeed the, the fabric of society. And that, that curiosity stays with me. And I must tell you, the, the, the spoiler alert is that after over 25 years of doing this, is that I, I still, when I have the privilege of working with senior leaders on the subject of leadership, um, of course, the, the question always comes up, well, well, what is leadership? And the best answer, tragically, I have, Dominic, after 25 years, is that a leader leads, <laughs> which is... Thank which you. Is shall, we, look, shall we end it, shall we end it there? Is, is that it? Is that all you've got? Is that... So I'm just... That's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> great. Great talking to you, Mornay. Wonderful. <laughs> When the email arrives or the call comes through or the request, however it comes through, is from the organizational group of people or an individual. And they say, I want to be a better leader or I want to learn more about leadership. What are they asking on the surface? What's the yeah. polite ask? But what rarely, what rarely is being asked? Well, very often what they're asking for is how can I get promoted? Can I learn... Um, often the language people use in the request is tips and tricks and trade and, you know, kind of shortcuts and so on. Um, 
And, you know, some of those things can get you so far in surviving a meeting or having one pitch that works. Uh, but of course, it's, um, it's, it's terminally doomed um, to really uh, not survive in the longer term. And, and so as part of my work, uh, what I've developed is a so-called 11 lenses on leadership that really looks at the subject, the theory and practice of leadership from a multitude of perspectives, including from um, uh, a sort of behavioral perspective, which a lot of leaders want to learn about, what should I do? A sort of emotional dimension, which sort of took off in the mid nineties with, with EQ, of course. Um, but what I am particularly interested in um, in the last decade or so is the intellectual domain. Now, of course, as I've said in, in the 90s, EQ kind of uh, took over the leadership world. But I, I have to say, I've, I've reached an absolute saturation point with, uh, <laughs> with emotional intelligence, only because very practically speaking, I now encounter more and more organizations where everyone's terribly insightful about themselves and others and terribly respectful of themselves and others and nothing's happening. Yeah. And so I was quite confused by that idea. So my point really is I'm hoping for thinking to make a very strong comeback. I don't think the problem in the world is too many smart leaders. Yeah. So when someone asks you, what is a good leader? Often they're, they're wanting the tips and tricks to get, to get promoted, yeah. which is not a terribly enthralling response, but yeah. Ideally, for you, leadership is um, you're focusing at least on on more thoughtful leadership yeah. and incorporating the cog cognitive faculties in leadership. OK, That's right. let's come back to that, because, of course, we're going to chat about um, the mindset index. Now, you jokingly said leaders lead. Leadership is about leading. Let's just scratch a little bit beneath the surface. Mm. What is leadership? Don't just say cognitive process. <laughs> no, it is, of course, so much more than that. Mm. You know, Dominic, when I, when I say sort of ingest that uh, a leader leads, one of the things that comes to mind is when people say they want to take on the cloak of leaders, I, I often wonder, why would you want to do that? What could possibly motivate you to take on the full scope of responsibility that leaders really need to embrace? Are you really willing to stand out from the crowd, to venture, to propose, to risk ridicule, to be deeply curious, to have always one more step of energy than everybody else? I'm not sure you really do. I know you want the corner office and the nice car and the privileged parking, that we all get. And you want to go on the benchmarking exercise in Scandinavia and get another PA. We all understand that. When I say a leader leads, I'm really alluding to the fact that you're invited now, either by yourself or your institution, to take that one extra step. And while connecting yourself to an increasingly expansive scope of stakeholders, to nevertheless distinguish yourself from the crowd. Because you can't have it both ways, can you? <laughs> and this we see quite often. You know, I'd love to become a leader. Well, here's some responsibility for you. Oh, we'll distribute that among everyone on the theory that everyone is participating in leadership. Mm. And I think there's a little bit of a cop out there. So to me, when I say a leader leads, I mean, it is that however minor separation from the pack that comes with an enormous amount of responsibility to yourself, to others, your vast expanse of stakeholders, the society, the planet, and so on. Yeah. My fascination with the city is, is more or less as follows. As an Aspen Systems thinker, I think, of course, of leverage points. And when I think of a city, mm -hmm. I think of an entity that's been around for, whatever, six, six and a half thousand years. It still mm -hmm. only occupies 2% of the world's land surface, mm -hmm. uh, yet houses nearly 60% of hu humanity. It produces um, 
more carbon emissions than anywhere else, more ideas, knowledge than anywhere else. It consumes more than anywhere else. And it has a profound impact on the course of history. It's been said that um, the future of humanity will play out in, in cities. Hence, mm. you know, what I've called this conversation where the future plays out. My question is, in that context, what is the role of leadership in a city? It's an intriguing question. If you think about why did we as humanity form cities in the first place, when we had all the space in the world, but why, why did we congregate in, the, in, in quite this way? Why did we evolve the way we live in this particular way? And I think there's a, there's a sort of emergent answer to that from the complexity of human behavior. And there is an aspirant dimension to that, teleological dimension. In other words, it's what we actually want. Of course, with emergence, you often get not exactly what you want. So in a sense, cities have always drawn leaders. I think that's a first important understanding, that you're already working with a large number of people who are already in various fields, institutionally or intellectually or socially, leading in some form or another. That is an important insight when you're trying to lead a city which consists of these people. So you, you're familiar with some of my writing on smart cities for smart people. Mm. And of course, I, I, I just a moment ago illustrated the enormous burden of espousing the title of leadership. So you want to lead in a place already heavily populated by leaders. Wow, what an enormous opportunity, privilege, and complex burden. So there's a kind of meta leadership dimension here that if you're trying to lead a city, you're already leading people who are already leaders. For that reason, I think it's important that when you are leading a city, you're conscious of this incredible pool of talent available at your disposal. And I think smart cities of the future will be those that recognize in a humble way the incredible smarts of the leaders who live in those cities and will make the most of that. And so you're almost thinking of a city as, uh, as an institution then, in the sense that you're thinking of citizens as talent. That perspective we're not seeing an awful lot of when we look at traditional city designs and the way that decisions, for example, have classically been made in cities. Those decisions have often been made for or on behalf of citizens. I think what's starting to emerge, of course, is decisions by citizens, a much more evolved form of decision-making in cities. So as someone who's curious about how the mind works, I'm fascinated by how decisions are made and why they're made in a particular way. And I think in cities, what's starting to emerge is the opportunity for leaders to connect with other leaders in a much more meaningful way and allow cities to be co-designed for the future. Of course, with all the fantastic principles from systems thinking around living systems and so on. Just to reflect back on what you said, essentially, or a useful way of looking at a city is it is a complexity which has emerged over time, certainly about mm. six, six and a half thousand years. And the opportunity there, um, stroke need for a leader, uh, is the ability to connect with the multitude of different minds and people in that mm. city. Secondly, thirdly, given that observation, it's perhaps not such a good idea to run a city as has been run to date, and that is more hierarchically. In other words, yeah. some, I would imagine sometimes at the expense of a citizen. Are you saying that a systems mindset is useful to bring to a city and to view a city as a complex dynamic system? I think that's right. If you think about the emergence of cities around 7,000 years ago, east of the Mediterranean, um, you, can, you can very well imagine, of course, that this was well before even the very first industrial revolution. Um, which is only sort of 200 years ago. So, so for the vast majority of the history of the development of cities, of course, we weren't thinking of them 
really as industrial hubs. We were really thinking of them as, as new forms of society where an increasing number of connections could be made with an increasing number of diverse people. Cities by their very definition are more diverse. The beauty of systems thinking and particularly living systems theory here is when you start thinking of a city as a living organism, you start thinking very carefully about how you value these various role players in that system, how they really move and how that city can become alive. Now, going back to the first industrial revolution and what that did for the development of cities really gave us the mindset that cities work like machines, that they are to be treated like machines, that there are good parts and bad parts, the bad parts must be avoided or removed or replaced, and that they're, they're almost programmed uh, that's the way that city fathers would think about it. But when you think about where we are now, we're almost relearning the wisdom of living systems and thinking about how cities can be viewed through a living systems lens that help us to think about the wisdom of cities that include these leaders we just referred to and how that wisdom, for example, flows through the city, moves through the city, um, and that wisdom can take the form of uh, the intellect of the talent there, but of course includes its, its natural resources. It sounds intuitive, doesn't it? And yet when you look at city design and you see the enormous disjuncture between where so many of the, the, the citizens live and where so many of the working opportunities are, the disjuncture between various, uh, particularly in some developing economies, between where citizens live and, and what the transport infrastructure looks like, then you can see actually that the simple idea of connectedness, even that is something we're just beginning to learn about uh, as we think about cities as living systems. A leader with a systemic mindset operating effectively in the city setting, what would their core competencies be? To me, uh, from a systems thinking perspective, the, the first realization would be that you're dealing with a multitude of interconnected entities and interconnected systems. So communities are systems, and that includes geographical communities, business communities, social communities, a number of others. That's the, really the first question. Do I have an appreciation of these, these interwoven systems at play here? The second competence there is to have a deep appreciation for the purpose of those systems. What are those systems trying to do in the first place? Spoiler alert, the answer is not to please the city fathers. <laughs> it's, really, it's really the other way around, of course. Yeah, people don't move to cities because of politicians. What an opportunity. Let's go to the city. <laughs> but the third thing is, is then to say, well, what role do those subsystems in the city play in the overall purpose, mission of the, the complete city? What role do they play? How do they contribute? In what way are they connected or disconnected? And then to say, if you just go back a little bit more, to say, well, what other communities and systems are on the periphery of these cities? Think about, think about natural ecosystems, for example, the role of animals and water and you know, mi migratory paths and so on, natural vegetation. How do we interact as a constructed system with a more natural ecosystem around us? A question we really have been terrible at for at least 200 years. I would start there for leaders in cities. And then if you're inside, if I could just jump there for a moment, if you're inside one of those subsystems as a leader, if you're a business leader, a community leader, a, a local government leader, I would say you really need a sensitivity for how these systems operate and how they interact. And that will have a dramatic change in the way that those leaders make decisions. How do you shape complexity? For example, if you were to put up your hand and say, this may be a better future for our consideration, like the SDGs, saying, let's mm -hmm. contemplate these, three, seven, th these 17 goals and 170 odd targets, which when summarized is really about you know, human flourishing, resource resilience, economic prosperity. How then do you get a complex, dynamic, alive system 
to contemplate something and potentially move in that direction without being a hierarchy or a manager. Yes. Well, I, I think you, you, you started asking the question. So I, so I think the, the, first, uh, the, the first principle there is to, to have a lens of a living system rather than a machine. That's the first thing. And that's going to change completely the way that you intervene in city design. Because if you, if, you, if you believe those systems will behave with mechanistic predictability, it will give you one set of decisions. If you believe they will behave dynamically, it will give you a different set of decisions. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's, I think wisdom perhaps in, in answering your question is to look very briefly at what drives this complexity. So what we would say is, uh, if I could give you a quick list, I would say the first is number. When the number goes up, the complexity goes up. So when you look at cities and where they're going, you look at the uh, what's interesting to me, the, the foresight dimension of cities in Africa, for example, we have about 1.25 billion people on the continent. By around 2050, that's the number we'll have in cities alone. And the exact same number will be living outside the city. So the number goes up, the complexity goes up. The second issue is the interconnectedness. So not only does the number go up, but the connections between them go up. And you can see mathematically that that means exponential connectedness. The third thing is that to calm everything down, <laughs> because it's, it's, it, it feels a bit out of order, uh, we publish rules, city rules, calm everything down. Well, of course, what you're doing by publishing a rule is you're adding to the number in the system, which means counterintuitively, you're making it more complex. I'm not saying you shouldn't have rules. I just mean that you should understand what you're doing when you are publishing that rule. So when you publish a transport rule, for example, it will have an implication on employment. The fourth dimension, and I'm almost done, is that the, the, this, one of the fa this fascinating discovery in psychology in the last 70 years, it turns out, Dominic, humans can choose. That means that they're behaving now like living systems, not mechanistic ones, so they want options, and they will game it. They will game it because they want to be entertained, um, they want to have freedom, they want to have choices, and their choice is not necessarily your policy. And then the final two is, of course, number five, is that we, we want it fast. Yeah? Speed drives complexity. And then the, the last one is, is um, to use exponential organization language, is dematerialization, which means it's difficult to touch the stuff, right? In other words, the issue are around not machines and groups, as in the Meccano cognitive processing from the first industrial revolution, but are intangibles, elements of trust, of confidence, of inspiration, motivation, a sense of belonging. These are the drivers of cities of the future. Mm. And these six elements I would contend contribute to the increasing complexity in city life. I really enjoyed a short, but for me, very enjoyable paper uh, that you published, Smart Cities Designed by Smart People. Mm. Uh, as I just mentioned, I'm going to read you two quotes from it. If you're anything like me, I always forget what I write. So uh, if you look surprised, you're forgiven. And, and just uh, pick up on just one of these, okay? Or, or both if you want to. Okay, so mm. the first quote is, <clears throat> With the paradigm of growth still dominant and likely to remain so for the foreseeable future, a new interpretation of cities is required that responds in more sophisticated ways to real humans with an infinite number of apparently growing and expanded needs. That's one quote. The other quote from the same paper, cities have the opportunity to become paradoxically more welcoming of humans as the criteria of human experience extends beyond the functionality of design of public services and utilities to include elements such as aesthetic. So the first question is, what could expanding needs of a citizen in a city look like and what role can leadership play in fostering those needs? The second is, what other elements should be taken into consideration in the design of a city and what role could leadership play in that? Either of those two. Perhaps those two issues could be connected in the, in the title of the paper, Smart Cities, designed 
not for, but by smart citizens. This is an interesting evolution in the thinking around design of almost anything. That You can almost think about a migration of design from perhaps starting with an absence of design. It's not really designed. And many cities, to be frank, evolved like that. It's not really a design. It's a patchwork. It's a bricolage. And to some degree, that, that, that will never end. But there's an opportunity here for design. But another level up is to say, well, there's, there's design now, but it's design almost against the citizen. There's an oppositional design. It's designed for the very few, uh, those with the, the, the utmost in power and control. And actually, the, the, the entire design doesn't serve the citizen at all. It's designed despite the citizen. To be a little bit more empathetic, one might design for the citizen. At least this helps us to think about what is it that the citizen want. The risk even of this is that it is equally patriarchal, as if city fathers and designers somehow have in within themselves the full knowledge of needs of citizens, design for. A much better idea, I think, is design with the citizens, where citizens become co-designers of the cities of the future. And if they're willing to share a little bit of their privacy and data, there's an enormously rich opportunity here to use that data to co-design cities. We will learn about how citizens actually move, where they spend their working hours, their leisure hours, and their, their, their uh, recreational hours, and so on. The ultimate level up for me really is, is the idea of design by the citizen. In a paradigm like this, uh, which is what I titled the, the, the paper, Smart Cities Designed by Citizens, there is no wise city father who thinks that they've somehow cracked the wisdom required to meet the expanding needs of citizens. Cities are never designed except by citizens themselves. And that those who govern the city are essentially facilitators of that design process. And the one I quote in the, in the, in the second quotation you use is, is the need for aesthetics. Again, in the first industrial revolution, cities were really viewed as functional machines, places that, that provide, as I say there in your quotation, uh, functional utilities. Now, in many cities, even that is not operational. It doesn't take an enormous amount of intellectual energy to imagine that as we discover more and more what it means to be human, paradoxically, in the era of, com of uh, complexity and technology, elements like empathy, belonging, community, um, safety, trust, inherently human traits, like aesthetics, something I'm really interested in, I think has to become an increasing part of how we think about city design. The sort of antithesis of this um, is Soviet-style mass blocks, as if humans are little insects that just need shelter for the night, after which they can go back and serve the government of the day. That's not a living systems paradigm. Designed by the citizens, say, again, that we celebrate, we value, we have deep empathy with the kind of wisdom we have in the city, and that wisdom can help us design this place. Something that's emerged in this conversation, a few headlines that are, are coming together. The one is we can view from a systems point of view, a city as a dynamic living entity, which is complex, mm. number one. Number two, a better future, an interpretation of a better future is afforded us through the SDGs. It's another mm. headline. And the third is actually something you alluded to in that paper, which I didn't quote. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you alluded to the idea that a city may in fact be something positive as it evolves going forward. And that's in, to my mind, in stark contrast to the view that we should be working heavily on de-urbanization. We should be working heavily on reforestation. Not to say that those things aren't necessary mm. in certain contexts, but it's it's been absolutized almost in certain contexts where mm. the net position is that cities are, are, are a bad thing. So those three headlines, cities are, a complex living organi organism. The SDGs are a future we may want to consider. Mm. Thirdly, a city may in fact be a positive emerging evolving organism. Mm. I highlight those three things as context for a question. 
<laughs> and that question is, what could a better, taking those three things into consideration, those three headlines, what could a better city future look like? I wish I came up with this idea, Dominic. I, 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 I really didn't. It, it's, it, it really kind of hits you in the face the moment you, you look at it uh, systemically. If you do a kind of even a very crude scientific method here and you compare the phenomenon of cities with the absence of cities, the absence of cities is not the absence of humans. So cities are, in fact, a highly efficient way of organizing human life on Earth. The fact that there's a higher degree of density it may not be terribly palatable to everybody, but that has a dramatically beneficial impact on the environment. I think I might be attacked for this, but think about it systemically. What is the alternative? The alternative, for example, is that if you don't have this centralization, that you have this dispersal of 7.7 .7 billion people all around the planet, who are all degrading the natural environment wherever they happen to find themselves. So cities give us a high degree of efficiency that may, in fact, paradoxically, typical of systems thinking, counterintuitively, give us a more efficient treatment of the planet. So the, 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 the impact on the planet does not come from the fact that we have cities. It comes from the fact that we have humans. The cities are a very efficient way of organizing those humans. And increasingly, we're becoming smarter at how those hubs can be organized. Get it. So cities are, to use a word, they could paradoxically assist us to accelerate the kinds of futures that we want because all the bad stuff, as well as a lot of the good stuff, but all the bad stuff is concentrated. That's Converse, exactly could right. Be aggregated throughout you know, the vast land mass, the, the, the other 98% of the world, which would make anything from sequestration to waste management to all sorts of ills much more difficult to manage. It would make it impossible. Can you imagine humans distributed evenly across Earth and polluting every little water spot they happen to engage yeah. with? So what does an ideal city look like taking the SDGs into account? What does human flourishing look like? What does economic prosperity look like? And what does uh, resource resilience look like in the city setting? You've saved the easy ones for last, Dominic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, what is, or, or perhaps you may want to answer uh, like this. What does SDG uh, 11 look like? From my vantage point, it really starts with the dilemma of the growth paradigm. Uh, it's, it's, it's very much a, a, a conception I share with my colleagues in the Club of Rome. But it, it, it's the idea that, um, that let's start with the principle that growth is not going to fix this. You might say growth of what? And I, by that, I, I simply mean um, the kind of brutal accumulation of wealth for a smaller and smaller number at the expense of a greater and greater number. So to me, uh, there's an opportunity for cities to think a little bit differently about the way that it designs the reality of the inequality among women. By that, I don't mean um, that we should have some sort of primitive um, egalitarian style existence. Certainly not. I think those, those kind of very base ideas really expired in the, in the 1960s with hippies and tree huggers and bunny kisses and people with hair like mine. If you look, for example, just at the, the, uh, some of the interesting, however contentious science coming out of the study of eco-modernism, I, I think you can see that there's a, there's a different way for us as cities to engage with our relationship with ecosystems. Coming back to our earlier conversation about the distinction between an analytical mechanistic uh, separationist mentality and a living systems mentality, I would say that increasingly uh, there's, there's this emergent realization that, that cities are in fact not separate from nature, that there's not a city wall where nature ends and human civilization begins, that we're, we're thinking of cities as part of the fabric of the planet. It's something we learn from systems thinking. There is no away. There is no real boundary. And any boundary is really artificial. It's all interconnected. So, so I would start with the ideas of, of how are we thinking about growth and how we're filtering that into the design. 
And then how do we make cities part of the fabric of nature? To quote a very practical example here, just think of roof, rooftop gardens, think of bridges across highways now constructed to respect ancient animal migratory patterns. Those are, I think, some of the early examples of where we're viewing cities as part of the systems of which they are inevitably a part and not separated from. Perhaps a philosophical response to your question, but to me, um, it all starts with how you think about it. Before we get to the mindset index, trust. What is the role of trust in leadership in the city setting? What is the role of trust? Coming at that question from a, from a research perspective, trust has a lot to do with reliability. So in other words, can I rely on the outcomes of this thinking for my next set of decisions? For cities, I think that includes, can I bring my talent to your city? Can I entrust my experience, my desire for a certain lifestyle, my willingness to make a contribution to the society? Can I entrust this to the space that you are governing? And if not... I will be much more discerning about which cities will benefit from my talent. So in Foresight, for example, we, we often look at where is the money going? Where is the talent moving? How is the power shifting? And how is the attention shifting? And I think when you apply those four ideas to cities, you could say, well, if I don't trust the city environment... <laughs> <laughs> Let me, shall I start that again? Does she, does she not trust the city environment? <laughs> <laughs> if I don't trust the, the city environment, then I will not invest my talent. Oh, my word, this is not. <laughs> Let it go. Lola. Let it go. <laughs> What's the dog's name? She's, well, we got two dogs during COVID. The first one, How because it was children, COVID. Monet. What's that? I said other people had children. They made babies. I know. Uh, I, it's too expensive um, <laughs> and not good for the planet. Um, the, uh, we had got two dogs during COVID. The first one we got, because it was COVID, we called Murphy after the famous law. Um, now, I wanted, then we got another dog, which I wanted to call Cole, because then you could have Murphy's law and Cole's law. <laughs> Um, my wife didn't go for it. So we wanted something more upbeat for the second dog. Yeah. And so we called her Lola after the famous <laughs> showgirl. <laughs> okay. um, Wonderful so digression. When, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when, so when you think about, um, you know, some of those dots on the horizon to watch, the shifting of talent, money, power, and attention, then if I don't trust the city environment, I'm not going to invest my talent there, very importantly. I'm not going to, even if I live there, demonstrate my talent in the interest of the city. I'm not, obviously, from a financial perspective, I'm not going to invest there. The, the influence that city has um, in the world, I think, will, uh, will diminish. And, of course, the status of that city, the attention of that city, will be utterly diminished. So leaders have the opportunity to inspire trust by, um, for one thing, keeping their promises. What a rare moment that would be, um, uh, even on the, the very fundamentals around utilities. But then in, in, in uh, trusting the higher order needs of humans, such as an aesthetic environment, such as an ecologically connected environment, those demonstrations in the design of cities, I think, show trust in the humanity of citizens. And I think that will be reciprocated in the way that citizens respond in those cities. We've touched on a number of themes, sustainability. We've touched on cities as complex systems. We've touched, of course, on leadership. Now to the mindset index. How does the mindset index apply to all of this? Well, the mindset index is really an attempt at defining what humans in these cities and what the leaders of these enterprises, subsystems and macro systems in cities and larger systems like broader global ecosystems, 
what they fundamentally believe. It's based on the idea that your belief system will ultimately filter into your decision-making, which will shape your behavior, which will shape the impact you have. So let's work our way back from that. Let's look at the impact we're having on society and the planet today. On which decisions were those based? What was the belief system behind those decisions? How do you get in someone's head? How does, how does a digital tool get into a non, non-tangible space? How does, how does that work? It's astonishing. You know, we, we cannot be paradigm free. It's impossible. And so just as that old joke goes that you can see a lot just by watching, yeah. you can <laughs> learn a lot just by asking. We can't help ourselves, Dominic. We fundamentally believe certain things. And what we've learned in the research process for the Mindset Index, which took at least 12 years, is it's astonishing what happens when you ask people, do you believe humans make choices or do you believe humans are conditioned by their environment? A fist fight breaks out because I fundamentally lean one way or the other. And so we designed an instrument that we had to balance scientific reliability and validity with a kind of user friendliness to get into people's heads. The overall architecture is that the, the instrument has about 168 questions, but organized in, um, in on 48 constructs of mindset, organized around 24 continua, polar opposites, structured within seven domains. And so with that kind of architecture, we found a way to create what we believe is a world first in the scientific assessment of strategic mindsets, which inform us of why, in fact, people make the decisions they make in the first place. So I'm a mayor. I'm at the helm of a complicated city. Okay. I'm steering this thing. I've knocked on your door and I've said, Mornay, I've had a look at the preliminary research on your tool. Looks good. Right. Use the tool on me. What are the types of things you would find? And being a nuts and bolts mechanistic leader, how would you surprise me? And how would I take it to work the next day as a leader? The first surprise is to become conscious that you have a philosophy. You cannot be philosophy free, it's impossible. And that the decisions that you've already made were based on a belief system. That's the first surprise that we found for many people. It's a sort of aha moment. And then we reveal what that belief system might be. What might be, to use your language, the nuts and bolts of a belief system. Let, let us show you then what we consider to be the nuts and bolts of a belief system. So we've designed, as I said, this around these 48 constructs, but those seven domains are essentially around people. So what do you believe about humans, about citizens? What do you fundamentally believe about them? The second is about agency. Do you believe as a mayor that you play an active role? Let's just imagine how mayors behave across so many developing economies. Or do you think that you are essentially the result of your environment? You'll be astonished to find the large number of leaders who do not believe in their own agency. The third dimension is knowledge processing. Are you curious? How do you hunt for information? How do you epistemologically decide what information is valid, what is not? Would you, for example, tolerate this interview as part of your search for knowledge and thinking about cities in different ways? The next is enactment. So in other words, we all have to eventually, even after a philosophical discussion like this, we have to do something. What do you believe? How are things best done? Is it best done by others, by yourselves, in a sequential way, in a linear way, in a hyper-complex way, in a more circular, systemic way? How do you think things get done? You just incentivize people and off they go. Another dimension there is what we call the growth model. So how do you think about growth? Do you think there's just infinite growth, just keep going? Are you thinking more in terms of balance? How do you think things are advanced? What does advancement look like to you? And then there's a measure of reality. This has to do with how you conceive of reality, what you think reality is. Think, for example, about what the Roman Catholic Church thinks reality is versus what Bolsonaro thinks reality is or what the ANC thinks reality is, or what Vladimir Putin thinks reality is, or what Zelensky thinks reality is. You can see just from those few examples that no one is mind set 
free. And perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on these two ideas. You can think of mindset in, in at least two ways. The first is the idea that your mind has set, almost like a jelly, you know, or like cement. And if you're the mayor with a mind that has set, given the challenges you and I have now described on SDGs, you're not going to respond to an alternative future. And then we have some other work to do. And the second dimension is that you can think of mindset as ideas that operate in a set. In other words, a cluster, a connotation of ideas. Think of cliches or bias or prejudice as being classic examples of these. If you think of a certain group, there may be connotations that you may have. So what the mindset index does is it reveals these paradigms, in other words, these patterns of thought that occur again and again and again as an insight into both your own mindset and the mindset of the stakeholders around you. And then you can consider complementarity and you consider the implications of what this will mean for the kind of strategic decisions you make. So the outcome for me would perhaps be firstly some data-based introspection and realizing mm. that I do have a mindset and what that mindset is. Mm. Secondly, it would reveal to me how well or not well that mindset fits the world I'm actually in. And thirdly, it would give me tools to make better decisions as a leader in the, in the world I'm actually in, as opposed to this industrial machine, which I thought I was in. That is exactly right. The realization that your decisions come from your mindset is for many people a ha an aha moment. Mm. And if you realize that for your stakeholders, whether they're citizens or on your management team or they're investors in your business or they're the talent around you or they're simply your fellow humans on the planet, the realization that those citizens also are not mindset free. They have paradigms. They have ways of conceiving about of conceiving the world. And you can engage with those mindsets in an appreciative way. Well, that means your strategic decisions are no longer blind ego. They're appreciatively informed by the mindsets of yourself and of others. Taking the insights you've garnered from your work with the Mindset Index, the world that we're looking to foster, and the complexity of cities in particular, what would your top three words of, of advice be for a leader in the city setting? Well, if I, if I just sort of run through my mind some of the dimensions of the, the mindset index there, um, the, the first is perhaps to balance the idea of voluntarism and determinism. Voluntarists believe typically in choice, determinists believe in conditioning. And the reality is that cities are an interesting tension between these two dimensions. Cities give us choices. I've pushed hard for that idea. Cities are also infrastructures with, within which we move and in a sense, therefore, determine our, our movement. So I would say that's, to answer your question, one of the top three I would say you have to navigate. The second is where you get your, your knowledge from and what you think valid knowledge is. And here we dis distinguish between, forget, forgive the technical language, but distinguish between so-called solipsism, the idea that I have the knowledge. Think about the city fathers I described earlier. I already know everything that is to be known. And I will just execute this in my strategic plan versus a more altruistic sourcing of wisdom and finding that from citizens. And then I would say the idea related to those first two um, perhaps the idea of meritocracy as opposed to benevolent autocracy. No city leader wants to think of himself, of course, uh, as a mere autocrat. But surprisingly, we still find many leaders with a father-like approach to decision-making on behalf of stakeholders. Right. And I think when you appreciate those talents more, you have much more of a meritocratic approach that doesn't mean survival of the fittest, but it means not only celebrating those with merit, but also providing citizens with what they merit, what they deserve. Yeah. So in summary, the three, the three top takeaways or the three words of advice would be to be cognizant of the difference between determinism and choice. You may have more choice than you think. Mm. The second uh, is be open 
to learning. You don't necessarily have all the knowledge and the knowledge that you do have might not be great. And the third is the notion of meritocracy. Let the system, if you like, speak to you um, and let the merit of an idea or an individual or community speaks for itself as opposed to being more autocratic or I suppose one of the worst forms of the opposite of meritocracy is cronyism. <laughs> I can yes, imagine. indeed. Um, Mornay, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We've gone way over time. Um, I, I, really, I really appreciate it. I really loved uh, talking to you, Dominic. Thank you for your great questions. And where do we get hold of the Mindset Index? It's um, it, it's available online. You can find it on LinkedIn, I think, is, is perhaps the, the best uh, place to do it. Um, and uh, there's a number of videos also available on YouTube. Right.